This week on MS Refresh, Microsoft Ignite Analysis. Need I say more? Stick around for the discussion. Subscribe to stay in the know. This is the MS Refresh Show. My background is like Satya's. <laughs> yeah, no, it is actually right. <laughs> Aim high, buddy. I'm, I'm coming here live from Satya's office. Please don't tell him I'm here. <laughs> Get out of there. That's weird. <laughs> Hi there, and welcome to the Matt and Sean 365 Refresh Show. This is episode 14 for the work week of March 8th, 2021. Coming from the East Coast of the U.S., my name is Matt Wade. And coming from the West Coast, I'm Sean Bugler. And this week was Microsoft Ignite. Big ticket announcements included Microsoft Mesh, the mixed uh, reality experience, additional features in Microsoft 365, specifically Teams, OneDrive, Lists, and Microsoft Viva, and the Power Platform. In this episode, Sean and I will discuss some of our takeaways on the announcements, especially how they align with what you know we work with most, probably think Teams and Power Platform. Uh, we'll stick strictly to discussion in this episode and return to the normal format next week. So earlier this week, Sean put together a really great overview of the biggest announcements from Ignite. Really good job, Sean. So if you <laughs> haven't watched that, much. hop over there first. And if you're still not sure what this whole Microsoft Viva thing is, you want to check out our video covering that from last month as well. But let's dive into the features that matter most to us and discuss a bit about the event as a whole. First, if you haven't seen the sessions from Ignite, but you want to, you can still watch them on demand at myignite.microsoft.com, though I have also found they uploaded almost all of their sessions to YouTube, which, if you ask me, offers a much better viewing experience. All right, so Sean, let's dive in. Dive in. First off, again, fantastic work. Thank you for filling in for me. Um, apparently, uh, I can course. be easily Welcome replaced. <laughs> Thank you. I'll never be their real father, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Numbers are kicking it. So what uh, what was your big takeaway this week? What did you what did you think of the, the whole event? I mean, uh, what do you think? Are we getting online out? Do you think, or where are we with this? I'm exhausted with online events. You know, I I'm tired of Teams. I'm tired of Zoom. I'm tired of FaceTime. I'm just tired of you know. I moved to Oakland in the middle of this pandemic last May, mm -hmm. uh, and I got to tell you, Oakland looks a whole lot like my one bedroom apartment. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, it is a testament to Microsoft. I was saying this on Twitter uh, the other day. It is a testament to Microsoft that they are able to make Ignite feel like a big event. You know, because I mean, they're using, I mean, yeah. minus the, the gimbals and dollies and fancy TV cameras, like they're using the same technology we are, and yet they make it feel so big. Um, but yeah, I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. I'm so tired. <laughs> It was impressive, though. I mean, what did you think of the production value from some of the videos that you've seen? Oh, production value was was really good. I mean, I would expect that they're a trillion dollar company. There should be no excuse for for not having the gimbals and dollies, especially since you I know... have a video to send you that's going to make you laugh. Uh, okay. That doesn't check those boxes. Okay, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> although you now get like an inside view into every single employee's home because they're now recording all of their you know their uh, their session videos from there. So I don't and know. Some choice t shirt options out there. <laughs> right <laughs> that's definitely true so what's one of the big uh, announcements or updates or re-announcements for that matter that uh, stuck with you after uh, a couple days of um sessions and, and uh um, keynotes it was interesting to see kind of uh it, you know microsoft does a really good job of saying like here are new, like new enhancements new features and obviously they, they do really good at uh re-announcing things but one thing they've really nailed is reminding people that products exist by announcing them as if they just came into existence or rebranding them. Uh, a great example in the Microsoft Viva, Viva. <clears throat> <laughs> is uh, actually Power Automate Desktop. Mm -hmm. uh, so for those of you who don't know, the Power Automate Desktop application is or was Microsoft's way of allowing an end user with a Power Automate license to create automations on their computer that would, you know, they call it robotic process automation or RPA. And it was released as a desktop application last year, if I'm not mistaken, or the year before. Yeah, uh, I remember it being it was, uh, demoed at Ignite 2019. It, yeah. I was there in person, uh, yeah. And it was super cool. I mean, it's this idea of having this little robot sitting on your desktop waiting to, you know, do some legacy process, open up uh, an on-premise site and type in a username and password concerns, 
uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, enter some data that somebody had actually submitted through a more modern endpoint somewhere else. That was, it was a really cool idea then, but what they've done here is they've actually taken it a step further and it is now just a part of Windows 10. Yeah. It's, they've completely reimagined this as I'm going to call it Apple script uh, for Windows. You know, the, the ability to create like automations on your computer for just the most foundational things to be able to take data from an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you know, they've essentially re-envisioned macros, but for Windows, it's incredible. So I, I'm not a big automate, not to say that I'm not an automation guy, but like I don't do a lot of workflows or a lot of that kind of stuff. I never really, I did a lot of Excel in the past. I never really got into macros a lot and I never touched VBA. So I'm curious, at least with macros, if I close an Excel spreadsheet and somebody else opens it a thousand miles away from me, they can access the same macro. How does, how does the desktop power automate workflow work? Is that shareable? So if that, you know, if that person creates some sort of business critical operation and they have to kick it off at 8 a.m. every day, but they get uh, hit by a bus or the more positive spin somebody said once. In, lost in, in a, Disneyland. That's the one, exactly right. Yes, getting lost <laughs> in Disneyland. But Disneyland's closed, so they can only get hit by a bus right now. Um, what happens- in California, April 1st. That's right, 15 per <laughs> <clears throat> But what happens uh, if, if they uh, are not in and they can't like run those things? Are they able to share that? Is that gonna be that robust or is it really a, it, that's my RPA? I mean, this is early days. I would would not be surprised to see Microsoft uh, invest time if it's not already supported on day one to, you know, export these and share them. Uh, you know, it definitely does seem, and they're positioning it re really kind of as a personal productivity solution as okay. opposed to something that's part of the. Yeah, you know, it, they obviously it's got Power Automate in the name, but it is so distinct sure. from any of their Power Platform offerings. This is something that is exclusively about local automation Got it. um so i i still think that there's probably going to be an exportable element of it uh you know, there very well might be and i just haven't seen it yet mm -hmm. um but it is it, it almost would have been more fitting to announce this as something at an event for like the office 365 family plans you know that's how personal they're positioning this yeah um, sure but i'm excited and it you know it, they've been really careful not to reference this as macros except in really drill down questions because yeah, right. you know there there isn't a vb component there isn't like necessarily a, a heavy robust uh code element to it it's all you know visual editors it's all you know you click record and you just do the thing and it captures those all as individual actions yeah it's right up my um, alley yeah yeah, I, I think you'll like it. Yeah. Uh, what about you? What's something that caught your attention? Well, I feel like the uh, Microsoft Teams, of course, is my my shtick. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to that today. I think. And there are a bunch of different announcements. A couple of them were reannouncements, or hey, look, at, we're finally getting all this dynamic meeting stuff and reactions. And but the one that I mean, it did get play, but it didn't get as much play as I thought it would, given the solution it seems to offer. But that's Teams Connect. Um, which uh, gives you the opportunity cr to create a shared channel in a Microsoft team. I don't know why it has two names, Teams Connect and a shared channel, but those are synonymous terms. And effectively this is, I can share a channel with another Teams user in another organization, and they can see that channel listed in their list of Teams uh, and not have to switch tenants and be a guest. So effectively Microsoft is finally taking advantage of the fact that like Azure Active Directory is like the largest federated directory service ever probably. And we can connect across organizations as long as the um, information or the, the rights are given by the, the local tenant owner, I guess. So you basically have the whole concept of, I have all of my channels or teams in one place. Now, the weird thing about it is they decided to make it a channel level setting and not a team level thing. So I can't add somebody from another organization into a team, I can add them into a channel. I can still invite a guest into a team and they have access to everything, all the kind of stuff. Uh, but <clears throat> when it comes to the external portion of it, the no longer having to go up and tenant switch and have to hope like, oh gee, which notification goes to which tenant uh, and being a guest in, uh, that's a really big deal. Um, I don't know if it was just the simplicity of let's just take private channels and go the opposite direction, but the architecture is already <laughs> there, right? Like that's right. essentially what this is because you're going to get a SharePoint site with it, which is going to be just as much of, of a mess as private channels are, which is one of the reasons why 
you know, in the consulting side of things, like I generally tell people avoid private channels at all costs because they're more, they're more of a pain in the butt than they're worth a lot of times. Like really convince yourself that you need them before you go forward with them. Not that you can't use them, but you just really need to convince yourself you should. These provide sure. a lot more value in my opinion. Um, Absolutely. But there's just one of those like, you need to know what you're doing. You need to have a strategy and don't do things willy nilly with this because you're going to be creating teams now where you may have 10 different channels, each with 10 different membership groups to it. And that to me is just a nightmare when it comes to, to permissions and access and stuff like that. But it does get you that access in all one place, that quote, the kind of concept of like, I just want to see my centralized inbox in Teams. You can do that now. Uh, so I'm kind of curious to see what happens as so many organizations have invited people as guests. This is a step up from that in, a, in many ways. So I'd, li I'd love to kind of hear from people how they're going to plan to do the, mig I'll say migration, although you're not really migrating, but like the switch over from being a guest to a legitimate external user that's you know part of it. Uh, there were some details provided in a couple of the, the sessions as to like <clears throat> what actually you have access to and what you don't have access to. And there are differences between being a guest and being an external uh, user in this case. Um, but it is, uh, it's, a, it's a nice nice change. And I, I don't know how, I don't know. I feel like it didn't get like the fireworks show that it deserved for whatever reason. Um, yeah. You know, it was up there with a few other of the major announcements, but like I feel like it was more major than most of the other ones because this one has been screamed about by all of us for so long. And again, this is one of those ones where I would not have implement, implemented it this way. I would not have implemented private channels the way that they're implemented either. Like, but I, I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity moving forward for them. So I think that's something that people uh, on the team side can be super excited about. I mean, I'll tell you why they didn't make a bigger show about it. It's because they're saving those fireworks for when it actually launches publicly. You're totally September. right. <clears throat> yeah. So that was one thing. I So <laughs> a lot of the features that they announced this week were available this week. And mm -hmm. that's one of the ones it that... It was all e the overflow stuff that they just couldn't have ready Correct. by last Ignite. Right. So all the new icons for the Fluent uh, design of you know UI 2.0, that's out now. The dynamic meetings is out now. All that stuff is out now. And actually, I was disappointed that the keynote that covered this even said, now you can invite external people. I'm like, oh, well, that's sweet. And then you know I look into it, like, I don't have it in my tenant. My tenant has some early access stuff thanks to my MVP status. And like even that doesn't have it. So clearly, it's not ready yet. So it's the initial... Yeah. It's coming, but they said they kept saying now, and it's like, don't say now if it's not now. Yeah, you know, private beta. Now, if you're one of the select elite few. <clears throat> I don't even think it's that. I, I uh, think so it's... Teams Connect is uh, private beta. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. All right. So I guess yeah. I must have missed that then. Okay, fair enough. I wonder who, how you yeah, have to... It was a to... really quick aside. And uh, one last fun fact before we jump off this topic. Do you know what Slack calls uh, those features as well? Are they shared channels? Shared channels and Slack Connect. No shit, really. I did not know that. Yeah. The thing yeah, I hate, though, so about the, uh... that connection is that a channel in a Slack is equivalent to a team in Teams. Slack doesn't have the concept of team channels. Which, thank God. Well, <laughs> it would just be that much more com <laughs> complex. Or, you know. so. so that's my big one for this week. So let me pass it back to you. What's another one that, uh, that stood out for you this week? Yeah. Um, well, I think I would be remiss if we didn't spend at any time talking about the thing that Microsoft spent an insane amount of time on during the keynote, Microsoft Mesh. Uh, did you see the, uh, the the demo for it? I know you were really tied up over the Ignite run, but have you seen the, the keynote? Uh, yes. And the fact that you're, they're using Pokemon Go as the example of, of how <laughs> I can put some of this crap to work in a, in a business space just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. It's helpful that there's a platform out there that they can take advantage of to, to show off, but like, ugh. Uh, VR to me As, is still is still and will be a fad because you can't move right like there's no right. <laughs> AR fine but I don't want to get involved with it until I get like the Google Glass where I can just put it on it's not taking over my whole head and I can see all the screens in front of me so I have that much more efficiency space to work in yeah no and that makes perfect sense uh, there was a lot of critique uh, I don't know if this came across your your radar but there was a lot of critique about how Microsoft announced mesh you know they did it with and microsoft's always been known for this which is the the forward-looking futuristic potential of it is folded into the product announcement and you know you get this sense of like oh we can do all this today and when in reality what we're looking at you know a great example is like you know the woman opens up the laptop and 
you know, three yeah. virtual yes, screens. Yes, all those screens. Appear. And it's like, wait, where is that? I want yeah. that. <laughs> and that's so far and away not what they're offering right. on day one. And I think that Microsoft needs to differentiate a little bit more so what's possible today. What are you really announcing today versus the vision of five years from now? Like yeah. it's it's starting to actually do damage when people, you know, because you can download the Mesh app today if you've got one of those uh, HoloLens 2s. Right. And you're going to be sorely disappointed when you, you know, you watch the keynote and there's this big floating incredible globe in the middle of a room. And what you really get is uh, peg people. And, you know, you can look at uh, a 3D model <clears throat> of a pipe. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I come from the engineering field and like I totally understand and see the value of these 3D models for engineering design and like it's much cheaper to do something in the design field than it is in like, you know, on the editable space like that than it is to do it in the, in the manufacturing plant or the test space or, or whatever else. Totally get that. But from like, you know, most of your customers are not those people, right? Most of them are people that sit at a desk or in a cubicle or at home right now and are pushing paper or digital versions of paper. And like, how do you affect those people? Give them more space, give them more stuff, be able to reach out and grab things. Give me the, the um, minority report screen. Like that's the thing that they really need to be aiming for in my opinion. And I think the bringing people together, the peg people, you're totally right. I will not take part in any of those peg people events. It is such a waste <laughs> of time to me. And, and this is my opinion. And I know some people put a lot of time into doing this and like more power to you, but I just can't buy Send into it. Send off in the comments. But yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, Microsoft needs to take a good long look at what it is that they are promising in these introductory, you know, you know, highlight reels, so to speak. You know, whether it's with saying things are available now, but really that means that they're starting to roll out now or they'll be available in the next 30 to 60 days. And also being mindful of the things that they're promising in these sizzle videos that are like, oh, you, you know, look at what these things are capable of. When in reality, the, the product is five years away from being anywhere near that, being able to see people like they're on the holodeck, you know? I was gonna say, did you see that they, they were making it out like somebody could be hologrammed in and you could see them in the AR, which like, that all sounds well and good, except for the fact that you're gonna have to have a 360 degree camera studio wherever you're standing for that to work. And like, they don't make any mention whatsoever. So like, they basically brought the Star Wars hologram into play but didn't make any mention of how are you going to send that, that, that it made it seem like just having the HoloLens on was going to be able to be enough to send a digital representation of you physically to another person, which like, no. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Like you can't have that in the product video <laughs> announcing it, you know, and position this as like, here's what we can do today. Like you have to be more clear. Yeah. This is something we're working towards, you know, show us what it's capable of then say, look where we're going. Yeah. That being said, at the point when they do have that, if they don't get Mark Hamill or um, Ian, uh, what's his face? The guy who plays Palpatine, they are totally missing out on an opportunity to really just you know push the, the technology. Is. I'll go let Satya know. Yeah. Because right. <laughs> <laughs> you're still hanging out in his office. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> So Matt, bring us home. What's uh, what's something that you you caught your attention? Yeah. So one more Teams thing, and uh, it's useful and handy, and I like it. But I think it's a little bit confusing. So Teams webinars were announced, and this has been something that was sort of teased a number of months back, um, but it was sort of brought in as like a live events extension. Well, if you watch the demos and you go into your calendar, if you happen to have this feature, which nobody does yet, but you can click the new meeting and the drop down and it'll offer meeting, webinar and live event. So you now have three and there was like no mention of live events at all during the actual introductory sessions. The Q&A did have a little bit about, about it. Um, and the question in my head was like, what happens to live events? Like what's the difference between a webinar and a live event? And what it turns out is that webinars, and this is gonna be probably an oversimplification, but I'm just trying to make it clear to people who are now trying to plan, like how are we gonna use this? The webinars are really more of a meeting with a registration page. Kind of that's it. And again, oversimplification, but just trying to get it across, like that's the point. Uh, people can join and they can take part. That to me, that's not a webinar. Webinars are typically like a one or a couple to very many people. Uh, that's not what this necessarily is. It can be. Uh, you can have the 300 or the 350 people in a meeting. You can you know, hard mute them and do all that kind of stuff, uh, but they register to join. 
to, to come into that meeting and to be part of the meeting. You can also push it out to up to 20,000 people, which is sort of the live event thing. So it's sort of a medium in between. The live event is more of a, not more of, definitely a one or few to very many people. You, you know, the chat, for example, is only available to the producers and presenters. The Q&A is what's actually available to the people that are watching. Um, so you kind of have this, you know, a meeting is an open space. A webinar is a registration sort of protected wall space, uh, which can be sent out to a lot of people. And then a live event is only, you know, sent out to a lot of people. Um, I believe all the features of the webinar are actually available. Sorry, all the features of a meeting are in a webinar. So I think that availability to the 20,000 will eventually be available in a regular meeting as well. Uh, the, I think the webinar really just puts that registration page in, in place. And there's a bunch of connections now to Dynamics 365. So you can do you know, marketing follow-ups and emails and, and things like that to try to, uh, to keep up on pulling customers in and leads and, and that kind of thing. So um, the webinar thing, super cool. You know, the registration page, not having to go pay for GoToWebinar or Citrix or some other um, um, uh, tool out there. Hey, that's pretty sweet. Uh, webinars are going to be available with your E3 license and a number of the other uh, licenses. Actually, I didn't hear about E5, which seems kind of crazy, but I heard specifically E3. They just kept saying E3 and above. Oh, I heard E3 business premium and business essentials. I didn't hear E5 anywhere in the discussion. It was like, wait, what? So I don't know. Maybe that is too. But so I we thought that just started paying for it. They better not take that. Away. I know, right? <laughs> so all three will exist in the same space, but it's going to be another one of those which tool when questions, uh, and that just you know adds that much more reason for uh, you know um, uh, job security for me, I guess, since I, I do like yeah, the which no tool kidding. when stuff. So. Yeah, I appreciate the clarity on that because it was something that came to mind as well. It felt like an evolution of live events, not necessarily yeah. a, a coexistent feature. Um, but I'll be interested to see how that evolves, whether it's with like multicast streaming or things like that with live events. Like, I'll be interested to see if there are plans to evolve that more over time. Yeah, and keep in mind, live events works both in Teams and um, Yammer. And it's built on stream. So I think it's because you couldn't do the registration thing with Yammer. There's, you kind of have to build it on one platform versus the live events are on, on another platform, which is technically stream under the cover. Makes sense. I'll be interested to see. I'm waiting to get my hands on it. I think they said this month, um, which to the point we were making just a moment ago, I don't actually know if that means like it's going to get to your tenant uh, MVP right. first, <clears throat> uh, and then I'll see it in May. So we'll see. Looking forward to it nonetheless. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I think that just about does it for our Ignite coverage this time. Uh, one last helpful thing. Susan Hanley, a Microsoft MVP, has collected as many of the roadmap slides from sessions as she possibly could. I included a link to her list in the description. Should be pretty helpful for your planning purposes. And Sean, any other parting, uh, parting words? Besides being a big fan of Sue Hanley, um, <laughs> Uh, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, I know we're going to drop this video uh, on Monday, I think is the plan. Uh, so Tuesday, I'll be hosting a Twitter space with Ben Stejink of the MSIT Pro uh, Cloud Podcast. Uh, so that's going to be great. That's going to be 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard. If you don't follow me on Twitter already, uh, at SBGLR. Um, and then Thursday, I'll be answering questions about Ignite on YouTube. I'll be tweeting out that link uh, in the coming hours. So yeah, I mean, if you didn't get your, your fill of all the stuff that's happening at Ignite, um, we're still talking about it. And, Sweet, uh, you're getting yeah, around. come follow me. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, on that note, thanks so much for watching. A like and subscribe is much appreciated. And uh, what did you get out of Ignite this time around? Leave a comment below to start the discussion. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. And we can't wait to see you next week. Sean, have a good one. And thanks for joining me. That was good to see you, man. So I can't wait though to pull out my HoloLens 2 at my next performance appraisal and say, but boss, look at how many Pokemon I've caught this year, because that's really what's <laughs> going to get me from that 3% raise to like, I'm going to push for like six, six and a half, seven. All right. I ain't taking anything less than that because that's BS. I'm doing a really good job of catching my Charizards. All right. Just saying. <laughs> I'm on fire. How is it that these are all like, they, they go with such goofy examples of this, like James Cameron and the submarine and the fish floating around. Where are the business use cases? Like, how is it not, you know, like a, a Power BI forest where you can walk around and like touch the pie chart and drill into the data? Or like, that's not sexy. Walk in the woods, uh, you know, in each section of the woods, like a walk and talk meeting. And each part of the woods is like a different uh, PowerPoint slide. Like, where's that? Bob Bichon, the guy that does all the, the events for Microsoft, 
time to hire Aaron Sorkin for your next producer as uh, as Ignite for next year. You will have the best. Wa- it'll be West Wing 3.0, and it'll be a drama fest and amazing. We will be binge watching it afterwards. You'll get so much uh, viral marketing points out of that. There's 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 no there's no no downside to this.